We're going to continue where we left off last week in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we've been looking at verses 1 through 3, which is a really vital passage of Scripture for understanding the human condition. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This passage is probably, maybe even more than almost any other, really unpacks what it is that we face. Even mothers, what it is that you face as you try to raise a human being to walk in the right way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it again together. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, last week, we kind of were going through this passage, and I gave kind of the outline for all three verses, which give us five devastating truths about human nature and the human condition. Five truths that these verses teach that show who we really are apart from Christ. We've seen that humanity's spiritual condition is death, right? Verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then we saw last week that humanity's spiritual ruler is the devil. Verse 2, you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And this morning, we're going to see the last three, that humanity's spiritual master is his own evil desires, that humanity's spiritual nature is depraved, and that humanity's spiritual sentence is damnation. So we covered points one and two last week, and this week we're going to look at points three through five. Look at point number three. Our spiritual master was our own evil desires. We were mastered by our own desires. Look at the beginning of verse 3. It says, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, and we indulged the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Now, I want you to, first of all, notice that in this verse, verse 3, Paul goes to great lengths to make sure he understands that he's talking about everyone, universally. This is a universal human condition. He says, among them, we too, and then he says, all, right? We too, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. And then at the end of the verse, just to make sure we didn't miss that point, he says, even as the rest. We were the same as everybody, just like everybody else. He's emphasizing, as he often does in his writings, that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Or as he wrote in Romans, he says, there is none righteous, not even one. But look what he says. He says, we too all, so there's the the universality of this human condition, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Now, this word lived is an interesting one in the Greek because it has the idea of to return, kind of to continually go back to something, right? They would use it, for example, in the phrase that, you know, a, a pig tends to return to the mud, right? You take a pig out of the pigsty and you wash him off, clean him off, you let him go for five seconds. What does he do? He returns right back into the muck and the mire. A pig returns to its wallowing in the mud. So when he says you formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, he's saying you are continually going back to it and back to it and back to it, just going back to wallowing in that muck and mire. But this word lived also had another kind of interesting usage in Greek times. It had the idea of something being flipped upside down, turned upside down, topsy-turvy, twisted, you know, backwards. Right? He's saying, you lived, and when it says you lived, it's it's a twisted living. It's an upside-down life. You were living an upside-down life in the lusts of your flesh. The way we lived was all upside-down and backwards. We were, as the Old Testament says, we were substituting darkness for light and bitter for sweet. We returned again and again to the lusts of our flesh. We were indulging our evil desires. 
And it's not, notice, that just one lust that enslaves us. He says, you lived in the lusts, plural, lusts of our flesh. We were facing not just one besetting sin, but a plethora of besetting sins. There were many lusts in which we were living. We are tempted by many desires all the time. And sometimes several at the same time. Sin likes to come in bunches, right? You have a sin and a lie to cover it. Right? You have a lie and another lie to cover that lie. You have discontentment or bitterness, and so you seek comfort in something forbidden. There's a lot of grouping of sins. There are lusts, plural, that dominate us. And this is really where the point of the battle lies. He says that we were living in the lust of our flesh and we were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And that is the heart of the human battle, the battle with our own desires. Right? Paul put it in Romans 7. He says, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do, I don't want to do. He's talking about that battle inside where we're wrestling with our own desires, the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The battle with sin is won or lost, not at the point of behavior, but at the point of a heart desire, the desire inside. A desire in your heart will lurk there until it has opportunity to express itself, and then it will take that opportunity. That's why it's so frightening there could be husbands in this room who are very, very, very much in danger of destroying their families through adultery. Why do I say that? Because the desire is lurking there. It just lacks opportunity. And so if the opportunity presented itself, the likelihood of resistance would be slim. It's at the level of our heart desires that the battle is fought. What do we want? What are we longing for? What have we allowed to take root in our thinking and in our desires in our heart? To change, we have to change at the level of the heart. Changing what we desire so that we want what God wants for us, not what Satan wants for us. Only Christ can change you at that level. Only Christ can transform the desires of your heart. And your evil desires must be replaced with a greater and stronger desire to love and obey and to please God rather than yourself or the world or the devil. We lived in the lusts of our flesh. And then notice that we were indulging not just the desires of the flesh, but also of the mind in verse 3. We are indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. This is the fourth devastating truth about man's spiritual condition. We are totally depraved. Our depravity affects every part of our being. Right? Flesh is a reference to the body, the physical nature of man. And mind is a reference to the immaterial part of man. His inner thoughts the longings of his soul. Our whole nature is depraved, both our physical and our non-physical beings. We're totally depraved. And if sin affected only one part of the nature of man, right? Only affected our physical part. Well, then perhaps we could overcome it by strengthening the spiritual part of man. Or if, if sin only affected the spiritual part of man, maybe by physical discipline we could control our minds. But our text says that we indulge the desires which come from both the flesh and the mind, all parts of man. Man's material being and immaterial being are both corrupt and depraved. And so we indulge the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And that word indulging is the word that just means to do. We're just continually doing it. And it's a continuous tense in the Greek. We are persistently or habitually or constantly over and over again, like the pig returning to the muck, we are continually indulging those fleshly desires. 
Scripture consistently teaches that human depravity is total, meaning that it has corrupted every part of man. No part is left untainted by sin. His body, his soul, his spirit, his mind, his will, and his emotions, his heart and his flesh, all totally corrupted. Genesis 6-5 is a key verse which summarizes God's view of the nature of man. The next time someone says they think people are pretty good, say that's not what God thinks about them. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent, right, there's the desires again, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then we flip over to Genesis 8, verse 21. The Lord says, the intent, again, the desires, right, that, those wants that come in the heart, the intent, the motivations, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Right? It doesn't, it's not like you're an innocent cherub and then you become an adult and suddenly sin kicks in, right? I mean, every mother who has been raising children know that you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child even to lie. It comes natural to the human condition. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and wicked above all else. Who can know it? You can't even fully grasp the depravity of your own heart because your own heart deceives you. Your heart tells you you're much better than you are. In fact, in Jeremiah, it says that only the Lord truly knows the depths of the heart. It says, I, the Lord, test the heart and the mind. And so Paul in Romans chapter 3 gives the great summary of the human condition. And as I read Romans 3, 10 and following, I want you to notice how comprehensive the depravity is, how, how it affects all the different aspects of man. Romans 3, 10. It is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands, right? So here's the issue of our intellect. Our, our intellect has fallen. Paul had just gotten say, got done saying in Romans chapter 1 that God gave people over to a depraved or twisted mind. Their thinking, he says, became futile, right? They rejected God, rejected the source of truth, and decided to rationalize on their own, and so God gave them over to a twisted logic, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Here's the will. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat. So now let's talk about the physical body and its behaviors. The throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Right? Flowing from the heart, as Christ said. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice that this depravity extends to every part of man. His entire being is corrupted. He's totally depraved. Now, when we say this phrase, total depravity, right? It's a historic teaching of the Christian church found throughout Scripture. But when we say the phrase totally depraved, sometimes people misunderstand it. And I want to kind of contrast what we are saying with what we're not saying. And I want to contrast the doctrine of total depravity with the idea of utter depravity. You have total depravity and utter depravity. And though Scripture teaches total depravity, it does not teach utter depravity. And I want to explain that to you. Total depravity, which is the teaching of the Bible, means that no part of a person is pure and untainted by the sin nature. Sin has affected the whole nature of man body, soul, and spirit. But utter depravity would mean that people always express their evil to the absolute maximum. And that is not the case. People are totally depraved, but they don't express that depravity in utter depravity. In other words, they don't always take their evil to its full potential or its full limits. And actually, that's because God has provided restraints that push back against the depravity of man. God, in his common grace, a grace given to all people, has provided several restraining influences to try to rein in man's sin. He has tried to provide for mankind's flourishing 
by providing restraints so that total depravity does not degenerate into utter depravity. John Calvin, who taught a lot about total depravity, emphasized this distinction. He says that you can observe that unbelievers uniformly conduct themselves, some of them, uniformly conduct themselves in a most virtuous manner through the whole course of their lives. In other words, they are totally depraved, they're tainted by sin, and yet, because of various restraining influences, they actually live a pretty normal or virtuous life. Hendrickson says, sinners sometimes turn out better than expected, while saints sometimes disappoint us. So see, the teaching of Scripture is that we are totally depraved, but not that we are utterly depraved. Total depravity means that every part of man is inclined towards sin. His soul, spirit, and body are all affected by the sin nature. He leans towards sin. But utter depravity would mean that he always does the absolute worst that he possibly can, and that is not the case, either in the teaching of Scripture or in human experience. Total depravity means that no one is as good as they should be. But utter depravity means that everyone is bad, would be as bad as they could be. That is not the case. Praise the Lord that he uses the conscience. He uses the rule of law. He uses the influence of the church and society. And he uses the balance of power among nations to restrain man's depravity and keep us from descending into utter depravity. Think about Hitler, for example. If there was anyone who was expressing his total depravity in a way which was descending into the most utterly despicable forms of depravity, it was Hitler. But think about what God did. God used the balance of power in the nations to restrain that evil, to stop that evil. And we see this both on the global scale and on the individual scale. There is a sense in which even the loving discipline, a loving spanking administered by a mother, is one of God's common graces to man because it is part of what God uses to restrain the expressions of depravity coming out of the heart of the child. God is gracious to mankind by restraining our depravity. He mercifully restrains evil in the world. Romans 13 says that God places a sword in the hand of the government in order to punish evildoers, to provide that restraint. Now, it doesn't mean that the government wields that sword righteously all the time, but it does mean that God is the one who placed it there because he knows that if we were living in complete anarchy, the absence of human law, human depravity would have no limit on its expression. And I've lived in some places in the world who have experienced some periods of relative anarchy. And the things that happened in the absence of the rule of law were absolutely horrifying. We would be in an absolutely pitiful condition without those restraining influences because our entire nature is depraved, twisted by sin, inclined towards it, wanting it, desiring it. Look back in verse 3 of Ephesians 2. That word indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, right? It's that, again, that continuous action. We were living in the lust of our flesh continuously, and we were indulging it continuously, right? Two verbs, both indicating that this is just the normal habit for the human. But I want to point something else out to you. When it says we were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, the word mind is difficult to, for English translators to render because it's actually a plural word in the Greek, right? But it, in English, we don't say, we don't, you know, that we were indulging the desire of the minds, right? We don't speak of the mind in the plural. We only speak of it in the singular. But in the Greek, it's actually plural. We were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the minds, right? Or the thoughts, plural. The thought patterns, the rationalizations. In fact, that's how one scholar translates the word, and I think he really nails it. He was saying, we were indulging the desires of the flesh and of our rationalizations. Our depravity extends all the way down to our thinking, 
all the way down to how we rationalize and excuse evil desires and behaviors. You see, because of depravity, we want something evil, and then our mind kicks into gear to excuse it, rationalize it, and defend it, and then plot it and plan it and do it. And we are really good at rationalization. Ever since the Garden of Eden, we've been really good at rationalizing and excusing our sin. In fact, the ability of the human being to rationalize sin is breathtaking. I mean, just take a child and catch them doing something wrong and then ask them, why did you do it? And instantaneously, they start to come up with all kinds of reasons why they did what they did. Adults get even better at it, right? Let's say that you've been convicted about the sin of gluttony and so you've been trying to exercise better self-control when it comes to desserts or sweets or whatever and you're doing real well on that new, you know, that new resolution until you see the piece of pie in the refrigerator. And then what happens? In a millisecond, your mind has come up with five good reasons why you don't have to exercise self-control. It's been a hard day. You know, you, you had a light lunch. You're going to exercise to make up for it, right? Think about other types of sin. Think about those who are trapped in a cycle or a pattern of sexual sin. The world puts an opportunity in front of you and your mind instantaneously comes up with some persuasive scenario in which it totally makes sense and is totally justifiable to indulge your lusts. The mind is a rationalization factory. Present it with an opportunity to sin, and it will come up with lots of reasons to do it. Rationalizations to justify and excuse sin seem to come naturally to us, whereas reasons to choose righteousness seem to come laboriously and with great difficulty. That is why it is such a process of training your mind to think biblically, to think God's thoughts after him instead of indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's why it's so important to be continually in the scripture and continually in prayer, continually in the fellowship of the church because your mind is going to naturally default to the old ways. Rationalizations come naturally because of the depravity of our nature. And that is the horrific condition of man. We are continually indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And so then we reach that fifth and frightening point that we are by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Our spiritual sentence was damnation. And when it says here that we were by nature children of wrath, that word wrath is the Greek orge. There's two words in Greek for wrath. One, thumos, is the kind of anger you might have when someone does something and your anger kind of flares up for a little while and then it passes away and it's done and over. But the word orge, which is used here, is a different kind of wrath. It's not an emotional wrath. It is a judicial wrath. It is a settled, consistent, and persistent wrath. It's the wrath of a righteous judge who justly applies the penalties of the law without favoritism. It just applies the law objectively. The wrath of God abides on the law breaker, according to Scripture. In fact, Psalm 7, 7 verse 11 says this, God is angry with the wicked every day. It's a persistent wrath. He is angry with the wicked every day. And that's why Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, I've heard a lot of Christians and even Bible teachers say, we shouldn't teach people to fear God. They've said, we need to teach people to love God, maybe to reverence God. That's maybe the strongest we can get. But don't teach people to fear God. You don't want to fill people's hearts with fear. Can I tell you something? The Bible very deliberately tries to fill the heart of the sinner with fear. In fact, Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's where wisdom starts to come from. The fear of the Lord. I remember in a, in a class we asked one of our professors, what, what's the nuance of that word fear in the Old Testament in the Hebrew? What, is it, what, what's, what's, what does it really mean? And he said, well, it means something, yeah, really, it's, it's pretty profound. It means fear. 
like trembling fear. Yeah. Like the trembling fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Why? Why is it the beginning of wisdom and knowledge? Because if a, peer, if a person doesn't fear God, he won't fear God's judgment. And if he doesn't fear God's judgment, he will find no reason to turn away from sin. He will find no need for a savior. Even for the unbeliever, fear of judgment restrains their evil. They'll do certain kinds of evil, but there comes a point where they're afraid to do more. And God uses the fear of judgment to restrain that evil. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's why it's so important to warn people to flee from the wrath to come. That's why we cannot wrong people by failing to teach what the Bible teaches about hell and the lake of fire. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. This describes the fate of those who don't repent. Revelation 20, this is how it ends for them. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. And by the way, we're going to return to this idea of the devil deceiving people. Notice it doesn't say he forced them. It says he deceived them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Do you know it's all being recorded? Written down. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, our passage says at the end of verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Would have been our fate too if Christ had not saved us. So when we look at these five devastating truths, right, we've seen that humanity's spiritual condition is death, our spiritual ruler is the devil, our spiritual master is our own evil desires, our spiritual nature is totally depraved, and therefore our spiritual sentence is damnation, right? We were dead in sin, ruled by the devil, enslaved to our desires, totally depraved, and therefore justly damned. Now, with our remaining time, I want to talk about two major practical implications. In fact, we're probably only going to do one because uh, in the first service we had a, a child dedication, and so I only got through the first one. So I want to cover the, the I want to stay on track with the two services because I was thinking, boy, it'd be a little weird if I went ahead in this one and then I had to catch up in the other one. So we're only going to do one, and um, you know, Lord willing, we may let out a little early so we can go and celebrate the wonderful ministries of our mothers. But here are two key questions, practical issues that are highly discussed in our society today that Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 addresses. And the first is this. Can an individual blame their sin on Satan? Can he say, the devil made me do it? What role does Satan have in the life of the individual? When he sins, can he say, I couldn't help it. The devil forced me to do it. Right? Does the devil make people do things? And if so, does it mean that the person is no longer responsible for their actions? And if so, should the church prioritize so-called deliverance ministries that focus on trying to cast demons out of people? Right? If, if it's demons making people sin, which is the core issue, then shouldn't that be then the focus of the church, what we focus on? Now, this is a huge, huge topic right? I mean, to really study this topic, you would need to do a gener Genesis through Revelation study. There's a whole course that would need to be devoted to this, and obviously we can't take on something of that scope 
uh, in just 10 or 15 minutes. So what I want to do is I just want to focus just on what this passage teaches on this issue, particularly in verse 2. It says, You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, this phrase in verse 2 is really complicated, and, and especially this phrase at the end, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It's really complicated grammatically in the original Greek, and so I want to take some time to try to explain it to you. Because I don't know if you're like me, I had always kind of just read this and assumed when it says the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience that that word spirit was referring to Satan. What we're going to see is that that's not true. That's not what that word spirit is referring to. We had discussed last week that in this passage and, a lot, and many other passages teach that the world is in the domain of darkness, right? 1 John 5.19, right? The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Colossians 1.13 talks about the domain of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about Satan being the god of this world who blinds the minds of unbelievers. So that's the main idea, that Satan is the ruler, right? He is the archon, to use the Greek word for prince. He's the archon or ruler. But ruler over what or in what, what way? I want to look at this phrase, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And I want to talk about whether that word spirit, pneumatos, is referring to Satan, the evil spirit, or, as it is often used in Scripture, as a reference to the human spirit. Those are the two main views. And I just want to kind of briefly walk you through the arguments for both and, and show you why I've concluded that this is referring to the human spirit. So there's a view, and there are a minority of scholars who hold this view, that the word spirit here is a second direct reference to Satan. In other words, the text is saying that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and he is a spirit, right? So it's teaching the nature, I guess, of, of Satan. And according to this view, the words who is need to kind of be supplied in the English translation to make the meaning clear. So those who hold this view would translate the verse this way. The prince of the power of the air, who is a spirit, is working in the sons of disobedience. Right? So in other words, if for those of you that maybe have a little Greek, this view takes the genitive construction of the spirit in Greek and puts it in opposition to the word prince, meaning it's a further explanation of what prince means. It's a prince who is a spirit. Now, in this interpretation, here's why it matters. In this interpretation, the verse would be saying that Satan, the spirit, right? There's an evil spirit, Satan, and he is personally now working in all of the sons of disobedience. It would be saying that Satan directly and personally works, that's the word, energizes all unbelievers. But there's some problems with this and, and reasons why I don't think this is the correct interpretation. For example, elsewhere in the New Testament, we see very clearly that not all unbelievers are portrayed as being demonically possessed or directly possessed by Satan or the demons. And those that are described as possessed are rarely possessed by Satan himself, right? We only have a few examples of Satan directly possessing someone, right? Judas Iscariot being a very notable exception. For Satan to personally be working in the sons of disobedience, as our text says, would require that he possess the quality of omnipresence meaning the ability to be everywhere at the same time, to indwell all unbelievers all at the same time. And that's an attribute we know Satan does not possess. He is not omnipresent. And so those who hold the view that this is referring to Satan, they say, well, what it means is that Satan is the spirit and he's working in the sons of disobedience and it's implied that he's doing that through his demons, right? So yeah, he personally isn't indwelling every unbeliever, but his demons are right? He's, he's, he's working in them through his, his minions. But you would expect if this verse is teaching the possession of all unbelievers by demons, 
you would express, expect that word pneumatos in the Greek to be plural, right? It should be the spirits, plural, who are working in the sons of disobedience. So I think there's some, some theological reasons uh, to not hold this, this view. But the primary reasons I, 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 I don't think that's the correct interpretation is because of the grammar. The grammar is pretty complex. It's, I, I don't want to bore you with the details because it was hours and hours of details working it, through it for me. And, um, but I, I want to just kind of summarize and, and point you to two uh, key guys. Harold uh, Hayner, who was a distinguished professor for 40 years at Dallas Seminary, wrote his life's work on Ephesians. And he says this, the prince, he says, if Paul intended this to mean the prince who is a spirit and who works in the sons of disobedience, he would have put the word spirit in the accusative case in Greek to make it parallel to the accusative case of the word prince. In other words, the case of the word prince and the word spirit don't match up the way you would expect. And then Greek grammarian Daniel Wallace commenting on Ephesians 2, 2 says this, pneumatos or spirit is sometimes incorrectly taken as a genitive of apposition to ar archonton, prince. He says, recall, however, that a genitive of apposition never involves two personal, two personal nouns. The ruler of the spirit does not mean the ruler who is the spirit. Most likely, the genitive use is that of subordination, the ruler over the spirit. So he's He's saying that what this is saying is that you have a prince and he is ruling over the spirit that w is working in the sons of disobedience. And so I think that these uh, two Dallas Seminary professors are correct in their view that the word spirit is not a second reference to Satan. So what, it, what is the correct view and interpretation? This is a reference to the human spirit. To the human spirit. The nature of man. And the nature of man, that fallen, depraved nature that we've been talking about, that fallen nature is working in the sons of disobedience. It's, to put it this way, Satan is the tempter, right? He's the one who holds the red meat out. Now, you could hold red meat in front of a plant all day and the plant is not going to take a bite of it. But hold red meat in front of a wolf and you'll have some action. What he's saying is that, yes, Satan is the ruler, but how does he rule? He rules because there is an internal ally in the heart of man that makes us do the wishes of that dark prince. I want to try to help you visualize the Greek. I think the New American Standard, the reason I preach from the New American Standard is because it translates word for word and gives you the best way to follow the form and structure and argumentation of the Greek. And if I was going to help you visualize it, it would be this. This verse is saying, we walked, and then there's two according to's, right? Remember, according to the course of this world, and then according to the prince of the power of the air, right? So there's the two according to's. But when it talks about the prince of the power of air, there are two genitive constructions, a double genitive construction in the Greek. He's giving two parallel ideas that are going to show us what Satan is ruling over. He's, he's the prince or ruler of what? And there are two things that he rules over. Number one, he rules over the powers of the air. And secondly, he rules over the human spirit. He rules over the fallen nature of man. He is the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. These constructions in Greek are parallel to each other. He is the prince or the ruler of the power of the air, number one, and of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience, number two. He has dominion over the kingdom of the air and over the fallen nature of man. It is the human spirit, that sinful nature and depravity that we inherited from Adam that is working inside of us to produce disobedience to God. That's why as Paul continues his thought in verse 3, he says, he says, this spirit is working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived. And then he doesn't talk about demonic possession. He talks about the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So the explanation given in verse 3 confirms that the spirit working in the sons of disobedience is a reference to the depraved nature of man. 
the nature we inherited from Adam, that is what is working inside of every person to produce disobedience to God. This really is confirmed by lots of different aspects of the wording here. When it says, for example, that the Spirit is working in the sons of disobedience, it's a continuous tense. What is it that continually works inside of a person? It's His Spirit. That's what's at work within us. This is what theologians call original sin, right? The sin nature. And only the sin nature it can be said to be continuously working in all unbelievers, all at once, all the time. Satan and his host of demons can work directly in some people some of the time, but only the fallen nature we inherited from Adam can work in all people all the time. And so only in regard to the fallen human nature could Paul say, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. See, verse 3, this discussion of human nature is elucidating what that spirit is that's working so horrifically within us. Demon possession where Satan works inside someone is not common to all people. But the fallen human spirit working in them is universal among all people, as this passage teaches. So Satan rules over the kingdom of the air and over the fallen human spirit. Where and how, right? How did Satan begin ruling over the human spirit? Well, it began when Adam fell and subordinated himself and all of his progeny to the authority and domination of the devil. It was in Eden in which our spiritual ruler became the devil. And it is the fallen nature of man, not the devil, that is working within us to lead us into disobedience. So for the majority of people, and now I'm not denying that demon possession is real. It is taught in Scripture. But for the majority of people, the devil's rule is indirect via temptations and lies, which are alluring to our fallen nature not direct via the mass possession of all people, right? He rules indirectly through tempting and lying and utilizing the hooks that pull that sin nature. And it's not too hard for him, right? You know, imagine, imagine the, the human being as like a walled city. Well, Satan is attacking from the outside. And it may be kind of hard to get in to that city unless... The one inside wants and welcomes that intrusion, right? The fallenness of our human nature is what throws open the gate of our life to the schemes and the temptations and the lies of the devil. His rule is indirect via temptations and lies which are alluring to our fallen nature. And so when people try to blame the devil and they say, the devil made me do it, they're not speaking accurately. Now, the devil may have tempted them to do it. He may have deceived them into doing it. But he did not make them do it. They chose to do it. Maybe he exerted great power through the world system. Maybe he exerted great temptations. Maybe he formed a, an incredible lie and, and, and surrounded them with those lies, but he did not make them do it. They chose to do what he wanted them to do. We are not good people who sincerely want to do what's right but are forced against our will to do evil by Satan. We are not innocent victims of a malevolent being. Rather, we are willing participants in a spiritual revolt against God, which is led by Satan. Satan did not make them. They decided to follow his vile path. Unless we have any doubt about this, the Lord Jesus himself confirms it in John 8, verse 44. Notice what he says. He's going to talk about the rule of Satan over us, but he's going to talk about why Satan can rule us. He says in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, right? There's his rule, right? He's the prince of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience. You are of your father the devil, but here's the key, and you want to do 
the desires of your father. That's the heart of the issue. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Why do we do what we do? It's not because the devil makes us. It's because we want to do his desires. It is that fallen human spirit that longs to follow that dark prince. And we see this. We, he says that this spirit is working in the sons of disobedience. Why, why does he use that phrase, sons of disobedience? I think he's quoting Jesus in, in John eight forty four. You are of your father, the devil. We are now working. We're re- referred to as the sons of disobedience. Satan was the first to disobey. And then Adam after him. And we now are in that line of spiritual rebels, sons of disobedience. In other words, We are culpable and guilty. We cannot excuse our sin by saying, the devil made me do it. Yes, he does rule over us, but he rules because we want to do his desires. Next week, we're going to talk about a second major excuse people make when they say, well, I sinned because I was born that way. And I want to talk about that pretty extensively because that's a huge topic in our society today What do we do with that excuse? Well, I was just born that way. But I want to close by just reminding us that Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 gives great hope because it says to the believer, this is how you were. This is how you were. You formerly lived this way. This is how it was for you, but it's not that way any longer. I put up this little saying, and it'll kind of bend your mind a little bit, but give you something to chew on until next week. The message of Ephesians is that what you are, right, if if you're an unbeliever, right, and you're lost in your sin, what you are can become what you were, right? In other words, you don't have to stay the same. Christ can give you a new life, can transform you. Let's pray. Lord, I do want to just thank you that you did not leave us in our miserable condition, Lord. The depravity which affects every aspect of us, body, mind, will, emotions, soul, spirit, Lord, all that we are is infected by sin, totally depraved, inclined towards evil, and we do desire evil things, and Lord, in our lostness, we even wanted to do the desires of a spiritual rebel against you. Lord, thank you for your mercy and grace in sending Christ to die for us, to rise from the dead, to break the power of the evil one over us, and to rescue us from that domain of darkness. For that, we give you great praise this day. And Lord, we pray for the mothers in our congregation as they raise little ones, as they are on the front lines of the fight against human depravity. Lord, may you bless them and may you help them to enjoy the honor they so rightly deserve today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.